Hare Krishna Maharaj, humble obeisances. Thank you very much for joining once again. It has been a joy to have you and many of our viewers have appreciated last time's podcast. They said very deep, detailed discussion with uh, quite a few practical pointers. And especially the common comment was that apart from what came below YouTube also is what I got is that we never get to hear a subject in so much detail in normal classes or in normal forums. So I think that it's, it's a, it's, I'm grateful that you're sparing so much of your time. So it's a pleasure Chaitanya Charan Prabhu to be on this podcast and have some very nice and deep engaging discussions on various topics that are of great relevance to everyone in the modern age. Yes, thank you. So that's our purpose. So today I thought that based on the theme we discussed last time of veganism and bhakti, we could take it forward to a related and broader theme of environmentalism and bhakti. And we could more or less follow the same structure that we could talk about how environmentalism has risen and uh, then you know how there are areas where it overlaps with bhakti and where the areas where they diverges how those areas can be dealt with so will that be okay yes absolutely yeah so no the environmental movement broadly has three aspects to it in terms of the historical or in terms of the origin one is the the practical consequences of the environment which started it then the intellectual intellectual understanding of why it has happened and what can be done and then the practical measures that can be taken for dealing with it so that means uh, what is happening why did it happen and what can be done about it? So now what is happening? It seems from the 1960s, 70s onwards, uh, slowly this awareness started rising that our rampant industrialization is having a lot of counterproductive consequences. It was broadly till more or less the First World War or even the Second World War, much of modernity had a very starry eyed view of the effects of science, technology, and the results of that for society. But the Second World War, and especially the use of the atom bombs, they that began the erosion of the belief that science and technology will be the source of unmitigated good for humanity of unquestionable good because Einstein was considered to be probably the greatest scientific brain of the last century and his greatest scientific insight that e is equal to mc square led to the greatest man-made disaster in terms of the weapon of mass destruction actually being used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So from that time onward the skepticism went on the skepticism was also intellectual in terms of philosophy of uh, science, philosophers of science questioning how reliable is science as a source of knowledge. Karl Popper and others, they pointed out some problems. So now when the industrialization was going on and when we were expanding our, uh, humanity was expanding its reach, there was just one definition of progress, more or less, that the more industrialized the society is, the more technology that we use, the more we push back into the, into the world, we expand humanity's reach, the, the more successful we are and the happier we will be. But the Silent Spring was among the first books that brought the environmental hazards into public consciousness and thereafter 
more and more things have become evident and especially over a period of time as uh, originally what was called was global warming that the uh, temperature is increasing and there were several uh, predictions of almost environmental of the earth's destruction but then now the idea has been broadened that it's not just uh, global warming but it's climate change and it has so global warming was one aspect that the oceans will overflow but now it is broader that there are many aspects to it and they need to be addressed so this is my broad understanding of historically how skepticism about uh, about industrialization and its consequences especially in terms of environmental consequences came about you would like to yeah. say well environmentalism as i see it is a response as you also indicated that because there were very visible tangible consequences hmm that humanity started experiencing uh in the last many decades so gradually there emerged a response and as the consequences became more and more harmful and more and more visible more and more undeniable the more the questioning of the underlying uh shall we say practices and philosophies that fuel that kind of situation began to rise mm. and ultimately then uh, environmentalism rose as a protest as a response as an act of concern mm. because after all what is environmentalism it's a kind of an activism yeah you know there are activists of of different sorts you know you have activists in various social areas or scientific areas so you have people who are very concerned about the way things were going on the planet and they did not want to see this destruction and this harm being continued so there was a kind of an alarm that was raised in the minds of people okay if we let the situation persist then it's not going to be a pleasant scenario at all mm. it's only going downhill so environmentalism actually rose as a symptom it it was a response to things that were seen yeah uh, of course uh, should i come to the second question you your first was what so what are the cons- what are, what is or what are the effects yes uh, i think vision and so on and so forth and the intellectual questioning of it yes we will focus on the second part i think yeah okay. you can come to the second part so i think that you know whenever we speak of a symptom of something or a response to something one must examine the underlying causes yes uh, otherwise one will never be able to do uh, the third thing that you said which is to find a remedy or a solution yes. or even to understand what's going on so because environmentalism is a kind of uh, activism it's a kind of response uh, it's a kind of uh, a concern and action based kind of um, uh, field hmm we we must see it in relation to what led to this whole thing not just the consequences but there were underlying philosophies hmm and events that happened in in recent uh, human history so i would say there were uh basically one thing that sparked it all off was the rise of modern uh industry like industrialization Hmm. specifically the industrial revolution i think what the industrial revolution did was that it gave man or humanity let us say a kind of a false belief in the power that it could wield 
and it gave a kind of a it diluted man into thinking that uh, humanity could control and manipulate nature at will for maximizing the pleasures and comforts and fulfill all the desires of the human race mm. and uh, what industrialization led to is also kind of belief that humanity did not need anybody else or anything else apart from its own intellectual prowess and its own technological might mm. so because of that uh, there were other issues that came up number 1 we omitted we neglected to see of the complex and sublime interrelationships that existed between the living organisms and and entities in this world among each other and with the environment and second of all it also gave rise to a feeling of power that we can do it on our own and that also probably set the tone for various kinds of atheistic thinkers in the physical as well as the social sciences physical biological and social sciences so i would say the 19th century was the turning point although it had been building up for a while from before when you had the industrial revolution starting mm-hmm. and then you had some very powerful thinkers who came along specifically karl marx who advocated a theory of social and economic uh, uh, you know shall we say well being mm. because he had a certain formula an analysis of a diagnosis of what was wrong with the world socially and economically and he wanted to remedy that based on his understanding so karl marx became very very influential and till today his thinking is very influential even though there are very few countries that are are communist china maybe cuba maybe a couple of latin american countries but it's not there but you have such influence of the marxist ideology neo marxism and so on mm. that is heavily influencing the thinkers of today the academia in particular mm. and maybe the liberal thinking of today Mm-hmm. and then also came thinkers like charles darwin mm-hmm. who then inaugurated a kind of an atheistic science mm-hmm. earlier also there were scientists who were somewhat atheistic but previous to that uh, largely in the previous few centuries given few exceptions by and large the scientists in europe who really inaugurated modern science so to speak modern science as we understand it today they were theistic they believed in god but from charles darwin there was a turning point yes so then you had these two things together you had the industrial revolution on one hand that gave technological might and changed the mindset of people in a certain way and then you had these power of thinkers coming along who became very very influential and then as the 20th century began and then there was a, a great explosion in modern physical sciences specifically physics and to some degree chemistry and then that perhaps in the minds of many people also a uh, strengthened the idea of atheism and as the 20th century progressed by the time we had reached the mid 20th century and maybe a few decades later atheism was very strongly entrenched mm. so so these two things combined the power and a sense of intellectual pride that i can figure out the world myself with my science and we've got all these theories so it kind of led human beings to go down a road which was self destructive and it was only a few sensitive uh, scientists who actually uh, probed deep into this and started self questioning 
you mentioned the name of Einstein, that he also started thinking, you also mentioned Karl Popper. Yeah. Yes, Karl Popper was, of course, a great philosopher of science. Yes. And he, he started examining the processes and the philosophy of science and, and what it had brought to humanity. Yes. So I think because of this, the, the consequences of everything, the technology, the industry, the science, the, the hubris of humanity, it all came together. And then before we realized it, the, the, de the devastation or the damage was quite enormous. Yes. And I think that is when slowly the environmentalism movement began. Thank you, Maharaj. This is, so this is quite a uh, cogent analysis. In preparation for this talk, I had a discussion with a friend who is who studies environmental ethics. He's doing his PhD in that. So he sent me a link on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Environmentalism. And it's, it's fascinating how they have the mainstream environmental researchers and environmental thinkers have seen these developments as having a significantly different cause rather than atheism being responsible they hold christianity to be responsible rather than uh, industrialization to be responsible they hold capitalism to be responsible and there is a utilitarian approach towards religion that is being slowly grudgingly admitted so basically what happened is that the the idea is why are we human beings exploiting nature the other idea is technology industrialization is a true but tech, that is simply a tool somehow i haven't seen anyone at least in the mainstream environmental research, holding science and the consequence of science as responsible for this. What it is, they have said that it, Christianity was existing in the Western world and last time we discussed about anthropocentrism. So because of the Christian worldview that humans are special and we have dominion over nature, so that gave us the entitlement mentality by which we exploited nature. And there are the specific historical trajectories and there are different for this, but that anthropocentrism. So not so much materialism or atheism, but anthropocentrism is seen as the primary cause. And in fact, Marx in his own way was, he condemned industries, not so much industrialization. His idea was that in the way industries work, workers are exploited and they have to do work which which doesn't allow them any creativity. Now, uh, and he felt that there has to be more fulfilling kind of work. So his critique was against capitalism. And if we even see today, the idea is if we have environmentalists who are, who are say there is a green new deal being proposed in America, which is involving radical measures for restructuring the economy, but there is not much accommodation of anything spiritual in it. The idea is humanity is the problem and humanity needs to be curbed. So what has happened at least now as a reaction to this, uh, like environmentalism has become a very uh, leftist movement in many ways. And those who are on the right, they feel that this environmental movement has become a, has become a tool for, for the leftist liberals to grab power and control us, control what vehicles we use, what planes we use. And there has been, uh, there has been a significant, not overwhelming, but a significant resistance to the environmental movement. So it has become quite politicalized. And uh, it's not so, at least in the mainstream, there is a utilitarian acknowledgement of the role of religion that just by telling people that take care of the environment, it doesn't work. So they say we need a cultural transformation or a spiritual transformation. 
and if people can find more non material enrichment then they will stop the rampant consumption of goods which is which is fueling the degradation of the environment so in that sense curbing humanity's expansionist reach by various political social measures including incorporating religion but many of those who even say that nature should be infused with the view of the sacred they are themselves quite atheist but they such a say such a vision that nature is sacred that might help a, for people to respect nature more so in some ways while it is leftist there is a significant openness to eastern spirituality because eastern spirituality often is seen to be more to be having also an immanent vision of divinity that even nature is sacred mm. so now buddhism has actually presented itself much more than the vedic path in terms of uh, how it can be environmental friendly but that's just the mainstream intellectual trends that are there yeah you made a lot of points <coughs> excuse me um let me see if i can recall the main points because there's quite a few important points there now you mentioned that environmentalism has become a largely leftist oriented kind of a movement and that is not surprising because any kind of activism is usually politically oriented and by definition environmentalism is a kind of a political and social movement that is born out of a concern for the protection and the conservation of the environment mm. i want to distinguish that from ecology and that's a very important distinction that i want to make later as we go down okay. so yes definitely uh, um it is a politically uh, connected or oriented kind of a movement <clears throat> now coming to the causes for the rise of environmentalism uh i would definitely grant that there are many reasons for it uh let's examine some of the things that you mentioned and that your friend said uh which is a thinking in the academic circles nowadays they uh the academics or many thinkers today uh lay the blame for environmental degradation and misuse of industries and so on at the feet of uh christian theology because christian theology they say is essentially anthropocentric yeah which places humanity at the center of the earth and it gives human a human being a sense of entitlement uh, that they are the monarchs of the earth and and uh, the entire environment is at their disposal to enjoy hmm uh now to some degree i would say it is true that that christianity is indeed anthropocentric for example uh, uh, from the vedic point of view as follows of the bhagavad gita we accept that the soul that exists in all living entities in all life forms including trees and animals insects but uh, many christian the theolog theologians don't accept that animals have souls yes that's true right so in that sense this is just one example of how the the allegation that is made against the christian theology that it is anthropocentric and therefore could have a role to play in, in environmental problems it has some merit at the same time i also want to point out that christianity has existed for 2000 years why have we not seen the kind of scale of environmental degradation and the other problems that happened prior to the industrial revolution coming in yeah we didn't have the tools we didn't have the tools so undoubtedly it is a mindset of human beings that drives anything 
because any action has to have an underlying thought process. Hmm. So the thought process is not an exclusive, this thought process uh, is not the exclusive preserve of, of Christian theology, to be fair to them. It's essentially a materialistic uh, thought process that we want to enjoy this world. Okay. Any, any religion or be, be someone ascribing, uh, subscribing to any religion or, or being an atheist or whatever. So therefore, uh, the entire gamut of uh, philosophies that espoused uh, a philosophy that focused on giving primacy to the human enjoying spirit and to the position of humans here is also responsible. But now after science and technology came to the fore, uh, modern science and technology, then man had the tools. Uh, science and technology gave power. And power has to be exercised very responsibly. It requires great intelligence, great wisdom to be able to exercise power. <coughs> and without that wisdom, which comes from some higher spiritual source, it is very hard to be able to utilize a wield power very benevolently. Mm. Then in the absence of a benevolent mindset or a philosophy that guides people, then rather it gets to be used malevolently. So even though Christianity did speak, does speak about a theology and there is you know, service to God, but because of this particular issue of anthropocentrism, there is a problem here. But this problem also exists with many other materialistic philosophies and perhaps some other theologies, I don't know. And this is where I want to bring in the point of ecology. Uh, it is a well-known fact amongst those who study this, these two subjects in academia that there is a distinction between environmentalism and ecology. Environmentalism, as I mentioned earlier, is a kind of an activism. Yeah born out of a concern for protection and, and uh, conservation of the environment. Whereas ecology is a kind of a study, very interesting. It's a study of the interrelationships between living organisms amongst each other and also between living organisms and the inanimate environment. Hmm. So, ecology is a science of relationships. It's very, very complex. And there are cycles, there are flows of energy, there are nutrient cycles of, you know, if we study biology or ecology or, you know, things like that, then we have all these cycles, right? Of how energy flows, you know, water evaporation seas, goes into the clouds, it comes back, goes into the soil, there's a water cycle and there's a photosynthesis and how the sun's energy is transformed. Yeah. So this is ecology in a sense that it speaks about relationships. Now where the underlying philosophies that drove the exploitative spirit uh, have what they have in common is that they don't have a holistic a wholesome uh, understanding of ecology. So therefore, uh, I would say bhakti ecology is a better way to put it than bhakti environmentalism because okay. uh, a devotee of the Lord <clears throat> sees the relationships you know, of, the, of the world. Now, I'll come to the other point that you mentioned. We'll talk about ecology and the thing a little later if the opportunity arises. But you also mentioned an interesting point that some people say that nature itself is sacred. Yes? Uh, At least we should inf infuse a vision of the sacred into our, into our conception of nature so that it will be respected and uh, right. protected. Yes, and ironically, these, some of these people are atheists themselves. Yes. Okay. So here, probably these are what 
who were called in the 70s and 80s, I don't know what it is today, deep ecologists. Yes. Deep ecologists are those who uh, try to, you know, see that man has a certain humble place, a position in the scheme of things in nature on the earth. Man isn't anything very special. There is no exceptionalism there. So the kind of vision probably extended a little further would mean that they try to see nature itself as sacred. But they may not understand the uh, spiritual nature of living entities, that we are the spirit soul. And they don't accept that there is ultimately another superior force that is controlling everything. Mm. So uh, we see that uh, such thinkers who consider the earth as an entire ecosystem, which it is indeed, although the earth also has many sub-ecosystems, mm. but these sub-ecosystems also interrelate with each other in a beautiful way for harmonious coexistence. Mm. But the deep ecologists and similar kinds of thinkers stop there. Whereas we as bhakti ecologists, as devotees of Lord Krishna, we do not see the earth as an isolated ecosystem. And actually, even from a you know, modern scientific point of view, the earth is not an uh, independent ecosystem because we depend on sunlight. Just imagine if there was no sunlight even for a few hours, <laughs> what would happen to the whole earth planet? So even apart from the sun and the rest of the universe, we're talking of a supreme intelligence, a supreme power, God, we call him Krishna, <clears throat> under whose superintendence and direction this whole ecosystem is going on. This massive ecosystem, yes, which is in itself perfect. Mm. And the perfection lies, our perfection lies in seeing the intrinsic perfection of each ecosystem within itself, but we also must see the interrelationship of each ecosystem with the other and overall the, the relationship of the massive earth ecosystem and the universal ecosystem with the ultimate source of all of them, which is Krishna. Mm. So because we lack that in the general world of environmentalism and modern thinking, so there is a great missing point. If you remember last time when we spoke about veganism, I mentioned a point that uh, environmentalists speak about mother nature. They want to conserve mother nature. And I said that what's missing is an understanding of father God. Yes. So that is what completes the ecosystem. So when you consider understand Krishna, as the father of all living entities, as the source of everything animate and inanimate, then you have a complete ecosystem. Okay. And if you leave Krishna out of the picture, you leave God out of the picture, your ecosystem is incomplete. Because the very root, the very origin, and the very source of sustenance and interdependence of all these uh, complex inter uh, ecosystems is neglected. Hmm. Therefore, I think where environmentalism has uh, a drawback is that it doesn't take into account this thing. And even though Christianity uh, believes in a, a supreme God who has created, they see, the, they see it from the point of view of uh, human exceptions. Yes. They do not see everything else as sacred. Hmm. So this, I, therefore, coming back to your, your point, uh, to blame, although Christianity may have a role to play, but I would not, to be fair to Christianity, blame it entirely. It is essentially materialism. It is lack of an understanding of our own spiritual nature as spirit souls. It is a lack of understanding and faith and belief in the supreme source of everything. It is a lack of understanding of uh, the divinity of the entire creation. There are two reasons why principally we believe 
as follows of the Bhagavad Gita that nature is divine. Mm. Because it comes from the divine. It is the energy of the divine. Mm. We don't accept nature as God, but we, ex we accept nature as godly. Because it comes from God, it is the energy of God. And that connection is very important. And the second reason is that uh, God is imminent in this creation, in the sense that he is um, all pervasively present. Yeah. <clears throat> Not only is he present in every, in the heart of every living being, as the Bhagavad Gita says, but he's also present in every atom. Mm. Therefore, every atom is sacred from that point of view. Mm. So we see the divinity of nature in this respect. It is not a sentimental or a utilitarian kind of uh, premise <coughs> for accepting nature as sacred or divine. <coughs> yes, Maharaj. <coughs> yeah. So now there are opportunities for bhakti theology to act as a act as a <coughs> spiritual foundation for the for environmental concerns right now environmental concerns yes. are are genuine but i would say that they are they are there is there is no proper world view within which to ground them so bhakti theology could work for that now, one of the objections that I have seen is that in principle, we may say that the world is sacred and nature is sacred, but is this seen through our actions? That means <coughs> that does, do we see, say, for example, in India or any other parts of the world, that because of our spirituality, because of our understanding of nature, we have taken special care of nature. Now, if we look at our epics, uh, there are descriptions of destruction of nature. The, the Pandavas burn the Khandava forest. The Hanuman destroys the Ashok Vatika. Then uh, when, the, when, Hanuman, when the Vanaras come back after searching for Sita, and they said they are celebrating. They disrupt the gardens of Sugriva. Then even there are descriptions of how when uh, when some warriors are fighting, they just pick up trees and hurl and destroy trees. So now that's one side of it. There's also the other side, historically speaking, <laughs> of there have been movements like the Chipko Andolan where people embrace trees and were ready to die. To protect tree, they were ready to protect trees. There are also cases of, especially certain trees which are considered sacred, people protecting them at the cost of their lives. So it's uh, it's one thing to talk about what the theology is, but uh, India is also has India. Uh, if we consider in India, have we really seen environmental <laughs> concerns being tangibly addressed because of somebody's uh, religious or bhakti beliefs? I think this has to be seen in uh, a complete uh, context. <clears throat> Um, undoubtedly, there have been instances of destruction, right? You mentioned a few, and I can mention a, like a few more, like Indra <laughs> unleashing torrents of rain hmm. right? to try to destroy Braja and so on, the land, holy land of Krishna, Vrindavan. Uh, however, we will see that these are by and large rare instances 
they're exceptional events. They're not the standard. <clears throat> Generally, we hear about exceptional events in history. For example, let's say you were studying the history of a king. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you will say, suppose he was a very good king and people were happy and, you know, the, he was very just and uh, the, there was a lot of productivity and so on and so forth. You know, a little mention of that. Not, but if there were some wars and so on, you'll find a lot of description, description and discussion on those wars. Okay. But in the day-to-day -day life of the people, you know, because it's a kind of a day-to-day, -day, everyday thing. It's just ordinary. So <clears throat> and there isn't much of a discussion there. Mm. So <clears throat> we, that's the first point, that we have to see these as exceptional events, number one. Second, even concerned with these exceptional events, why do they happen? There are lessons to be learned from that. Now, Indra was the king of the demigods. And he's supposed to be the protector and the benefactor of the human race. But here, it turns out that he was acting in exactly the opposite way. So the lesson okay. to be learned is that however high and mighty one may be, it is the way of this world that power may corrupt one's mind and make one proud, make one proud. And even someone who is a devotee of God may lose his good intelligence and act in shocking ways like Indra did. <clears throat> so in this example, what is to be learned is how fickle and fragile the uh, situation of people is in this world and how we should not act and how we should beware <clears throat> that even very elevated personalities can lose their intelligence. So that's one thing. Now coming back to other examples like Hanuman and uh, Hanuman burning down Lanka, etc. Uh, of course, these are acts that are meant to show to the world the victory of dharma over adharma you know, the victory of the righteous and the virtuous over the sinful and the demoniac. So violence is not completely prohibited in the Vedic scheme of things. Although the Vedas do talk so much about ahimsa, but there are situations in life where it becomes imperative to exercise violence. And that's why the whole battle, battle of Kurukshetra happened and Krishna was the one who basically uh, orchestrated this whole thing. Regarding the kind of uh, episodes that you mentioned, this is my response about the two categories of people who did that. But over and above that, the general way or, or conduct of life in the Vedic civilization was very much of a kind that was completely in harmony with nature. <clears throat> and that has continued and perpetuated over millennia and millennia. It was only in the last several centuries that there appeared to be some kind of a break or some kind of a deviation from this norm. <clears throat> Even till a few years ago, in villages in India, you would find such a sublime spirit, such a sublime sensitivity to the environment, such a beautiful culture of respect for the environment, such a high level of discipline and education and awareness about these things, that it might come as a complete surprise to us because even we as educated, so-called educated people don't do that. For example, <clears throat> take a typical village. One devotee from Orissa was mentioning to me that in his village, even till recently, till a few decades ago, they would have many uh, lakes or ponds and these lakes and ponds were 
scrupulously preserved by the people of the village. Hmm. And there were different ponds that were earmarked for different purposes. There were, <clears throat> uh, there were ponds that were earmarked for, uh, you know, um, bathing. And you couldn't do anything else there except bathing. There were ponds that were earmarked for drinking water and wells. And you, couldn't, you only could take drinking water from there. You couldn't wash your clothes there. You couldn't do anything there. Like that. So there were different lakes for different purposes and everybody understood that. There was also enormous forest wealth. <clears throat> and there were different types of forests. And each type of forest had a certain purpose earmarked. Some forests were those where the animals and the birds were left alone. There were certain types of forests where the sages went in for meditation. There were certain types of forests, and these forests usually were those that were adjoining the villages, which would uh, <coughs> uh, be used as sources of livelihood for the villagers. Mm. So it was not that they exploited uh, forests like the way they people do today. <clears throat> it was done in a scale of moderation. It was done uh, in a spirit of uh, sensitivity. Mm. And it was <clears throat> done collectively with an understanding of what was needed for replacement and for uh, sustenance of that particular forest. So there were, <clears throat> there was forests, there were forests, there were water bodies, there were animals, you know, all these were protected in, in, in different ways. <clears throat> so humanity, that is those living in the villages, did uh, utilize the resources of the environment, but it was done in a very cultured way, in a very sustainable way, in a very sensitive way in a very cooperative way. The entire village cooperated. <clears throat> you see, this was the level of education. I don't mean material education as we understand it today, but this was the level of refinement of the intelligence and the consciousness, even of people in the village who may not have known how to read and write. And this was there till a few centuries ago. And then what happened is that gradually there was colonization and this particular culture was eroded and it was sometimes willfully destroyed. And it came to be uh, that laws were enacted in the British times to take away the rights to the forest from the village to the state. So earlier the villages were managing their own affairs. They had wise elders. They were steeped mm. in understanding. There were saintly people who used to come there, live there, travel, visit. So because of the refined spiritual understanding and their understanding of spiritual ecology, <clears throat> this thing was preserved for millennia. But the moment the government took away the rights of the villagers and their, uh, shall we say, superintendence of their own resources in their neighborhood, gradually with passage of time, the government started exploiting those resources for capitalistic purposes. So yes, I agree with the point that those people said earlier that the uh, you know, rampant capitalism uh, was also one very, very important cause, but it's a form of materialism anyway. So, <clears throat> uh, the government started coming in, giving contracts to timber contractors. The British wanted to, to cut a lot of wood to send back to the UK, and they wanted to do so many things, to build railway carriages, <laughs> to do so many things. <clears throat> and gradually, the villagers lost the incentive they lost the opportunity, they lost that culture, they lost that mindset that it was they who were responsible for the upkeep of these forests and for mm -hmm. the environment. 
Now it was the uh, prerogative of the government. It was the duty of the government because the government took away these rights in the first place. <clears throat> so villages generally were of that sort. And finally, after years and years and years of such, uh, shall we say, disempowerment of the villages and the dismemberment of this kind of sublime ecological culture, which was based on spirituality and, and deep religion, what happened is that <clears throat> the villages started becoming uh, dirty places. They started becoming places where the villagers remained uneducated. I don't mean again, educated from the point of view of what we commonly understand it. But they lost that uh, <clears throat> sense of ecology, the sense of relationships. They lost that sense of uh, civility. They also became exploitative like everybody else. Mm. And then there were social problems. There were quarrels, the bitter quarrels amongst the people, the exploitation in nature. It all happened like that. <clears throat> That's why Mahatma Gandhi, if you look at it, Srila uh, Prabhupada may have deferred with him on certain theological issues. But when it came to economic organization and environmental uh, protection, he very much appreciated uh, Mahatma Gandhi's views, <clears throat> especially the idea of Swaraj. <clears throat> Swaraj means independence, but his definition of independence was self-restraint. Whereas the modern understanding of of uh, independence is freedom from restraint. <laughs> oh, that's striking. So in, in that sense, because the villages of, of your in India practice the principle of simple living and high thinking. Mm. So to, the moment industrialization came in, uh, mass production, mass consumption, consumerism, and all of that started to get encouraged with industrialization, technology, and so on. That, sub, that sublime innocence, that beautiful culture of spiritual ecology of the villages was lost. So it's not that uh, <clears throat> there weren't examples. There were examples. There was, over a period of the last few cent some centuries, a uh, gradual deterioration in that because of the factors that I just mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. That's quite a comprehensive overview. While you're talking, I just remembered that in the Mahabharata, when the Pandavas are in the forest, Vyasadeva comes to meet them and says that, you know, you, you have stayed here for a sufficient amount of time and many sages come and to visit you also. You stay for too long over here. The, the flora and fauna here will get disrupted. You yes. can move to another place now. Yes. So that is yeah. environmental sensitivity, we could say. And yeah. uh, other point about self-sufficiency, that is some, I have been reading about Indian history and I found that uh, in some ways, <clears throat> before uh, the British came and before colonization, even when India was ruled by Islamic invaders, they didn't interfere so too much with the with the socio economic systems. They did disrupt the religious structures, but the socio economic structures were maintained in their own way. And as long as they got their tariffs, they got their taxes, they they left people alone. And that was one of the reasons why India has been so resilient. Although the cities were uh, <coughs> visible, visible manifestations of wealth and opulence, but it was the villages which were the sources of the wealth. And invaders came and plundered the cities, but, and that plunder was dev devastating, but the villages were not affected that much. And within a few years or a few decades, again, there was a resurgence because the village villages were still prosperous or rather they were the source of prosperity <coughs> and uh, so self-sufficiency in terms of uh, 
लोकल लीडर्स मैनेजिंग थिंग्स लोकली इज इज समथिंग विच actually keeps people more in tune with the ecology you know in some ways capitalism is blamed but when you are talking about the government taking power this is what happened uh, in a very tragic way in china at the time of mao zedong's rule there is something called the great leap forward and he he wanted to show how china is prosperous and he had the idea that all the grains from all over china will be centralized brought to the central place and then <laughs> allotted everywhere and then so there were people they would grow land grow grains but they were not allowed to use them and all the grains were taken for them and they were kept in the granaries and stocked so outside those granaries people were starving and dying and but those grains were not given and everybody started inflating that we have got this many grains we have got this many grains because none of them wanted to incur the wrath of the the ruler and eventually millions of millions of people perished in that famine which came from too much uh, centralization so it's not just capitalism in in terms of political ideology capitalism and communism uh, differ substantially but in terms of having a common denominator of <laughs> materialism and exploitation of nature for the purposes of humanity I think both of them are similar you know that reminds me of a little joke uh, of course it's true both capitalism communism all these sorts of isms are basically just different words or different types of materialism so there's this little quip i forget who said it uh he said capitalism is the reverse of communism in one man exploits man and in the other it's the reverse yeah <laughs> i think it is winston churchill i heard about this yeah no, not to somebody somebody else oh is it okay so essentially the point is that you have to bring in your spiritual conception your devotional conception into Mm. you think the culture that is based on an understanding of our spiritual nature an understanding of the existence of the supreme lord mm-hmm. an understanding that we are his servants and we have to be devoted to him and carry out activities for his pleasure to achieve perfection in our life to live a life of gratitude for what the supreme lord has given us to live in this world which is our environment mm. and to deal with it with respect and with care with love with intelligence mm. that is the kind of culture that can make uh, everything sustainable otherwise environmentalism devoid of this kind of a consciousness uh, will not sustain Mm-hmm. one of the prominent thinkers not related to environmentalism but overall sociological thinkers is max weber and he has the theory of the disenchantment of nature that that nature was in the past seen as <clears throat> infused with with uh, sacred mysterious mysterious subtle presences and powers and we have disenchanted nature and because of that we have lost respect for it so that idea that nature should be seen as mystical in some ways is uh, or rather not mystical in the sense of uh, mystical in the sense that we just can't indiscriminately interfere with the ecological balances in fact going back to the same point of communism it is that the birds which would sometimes take the um uh, peck on the grains and the crops so mao zedong labeled all the sparrows and other birds as capitalist birds and he had all of them shot down and eventually 
that led to other other predator other forms of pests coming up and something like china had to yeah. import about 500000 sparrows from russia afterward so nature has its own balances and um, they were so it will be there is a certain amount of uh, we could say decentralization you use the word disempowerment so for eco friendly culture to develop there will need to be a certain amount of decentralization isn't it so now this would be in many ways the environmental movement or environmentalism is talking a lot about centralization that in that they'll they'll say at a central level government will enact these policies and then we will all become united because we are all concerned about the earth which is our home but that is not happening it is actually although environment movement is becoming active the opposition to it also be, is becoming active and there are people who are called as climate change deniers that is the derogatory label given to them but they are saying that with respect to climate change the the skeptics of climate change there they have threefold concerns which in some ways i feel are valid one is that when we consider things are uh, how much of the climate change is actually uh, caused by humans how much of it is natural you know the earth itself sometimes the temperatures rise and go down so what we call as climate change how much of it which is natural and how much of it is human then second is how destructive is it actually going to be because there were many doomsday prophecies uh, about how the world would be by 20 2000 2010 to 2020 they're not happened and third is that how much are your recommended measures actually going to correct things so how much is it caused by humanity uh, how much how harmful are the effects and how much are your recommended how much can we change it or by by doing what you are saying so and from what mm. i have read there are uh, there is no doubt that the environment has changed there is no doubt that you humanity has caused it but uh rather rather than a top down approach where there is a attempt to politically enforce a macro restructuring of society a more bottom up approach where people are individually inspired to become more environmentally conscious more spiritually conscious Uh, that has a greater chance of uh, working without uh, without uh, making too much of a demand and evoking too much opposition so probably now i think we are going toward the maybe a, the last part of you know what can be done about it and what our mm. our theology can contribute to that yeah you mentioned this example of mao zedong and all that he did his ill conceived hmm uh, plans and his ventures you know uh, about uh, killing the sparrows and so on in fact it was so ghastly i think it was called the fourth pest there were sparrows there were rats there was some i forget now yeah, four capitalist prey but yeah so there were four kinds of such uh, entities I yes. think sparrows. There were three others. Yeah, I also. And they were so cruel. What they did was that not only did they shoot them, but what they did was that they galvanized not only the army but the whole civilian population as well in the villages and everywhere. And they went around uh, banging utensils with spoons. wherever they saw sparrows so they, they stood under trees where the sparrows would come and rest and they did not let the sparrows alight on any surface then they flew and flew and flew and just died out of exhaustion and many died like that. so so understand so here in lies a basic 
misunderstanding and ignorance of the fundamentals of ecology. That is why I was mentioning earlier that in the protection and conservation of the environment, an understanding of ecological principles is very important. And I don't mean just simple mundane ecology. That in itself is very vital. If Mao Zedong had at least understood even basic modern scientific ecology, he would have understood what kind of devastation it would cause just by destroying one type of species. Mm. So much of interdependence. But more and above the modern scientific ecology, which is very important, there is the, the higher sense of, of the ecology where we see uh, the role of the Lord, of the Supreme Lord of Krishna within it, and Krishna's scheme of things for the world, where um, every species has a right to survive and exist. Hmm. Every species has a stake, has a claim to the resources of nature, proportionately. It is not only the prerogative of the human race. So these were the mistakes, the whole uh, the paradigm problems with uh, Mao Zedong's worldview. So that was one part. Uh, coming to uh, the other part of what you said was about um, rather than everything being centralized, it should be decentralized. Yes, that is exactly what I was saying earlier that uh, and also, yes, I agree with the point that during the rule of the Mughals and, and other such invaders, they didn't so substantially uh, interfere with the socio-economic setup. Hmm. They did, but not to that degree. But the Britishers, when they came, they completely overhauled the system. Yes. So, as I mentioned earlier, that they took away the entire prerogatives and the rights and the powers of the local communities from the resources that were traditionally for millennia at their disposal and which they looked after with wisdom and care and love. Once they took that away from them, mm. then what happened is you alienated them, you disenfranchised them, you disempowered them, mm. and then you made laws sitting in, in some capital city somewhere. And then you expected everybody down to every village to obey every law you made. And because it was a difficult thing now in this age of materialism where everyone was driven by selfish ambition, and because of the simultaneous lack of spiritual education and the rise of materialism, it was very difficult for the people in the village to buy in to everything the government was saying, and even what the environmentalists started saying of late. Mm. So in as much as decentralization is important, it is not sufficient. And you also alluded to this point, that there has to be spiritual education. And there has to be a restoration of the spiritual culture in every village. Otherwise, it won't work what will happen is that instead of some, uh, some personalities, some in, you know, bureaucrats sitting somewhere, some politicians somewhere sitting at some distant place, you know, having their own vested interests in, in making some decisions or policies, you know, and very often they, they do it for their own private gain. Now, you will have people sitting at the local village level who will exploit? They will become okay. the exploit at that level because uh, they have the power, but they don't have that spiritual culture. They don't have that spiritual education. So in as much as uh, an administrative uh, decentralization is necessary, it is even more important to restore, to revive, to strengthen the spiritual culture by making people aware of the fundamental bhakti ecological principles or the spiritual ecological principles. Mm -hmm. So when one takes to the process of devotional service, 
Uh, and that's also another reason, uh, coming back to an earlier point you had made about why we have seen so many mistakes in our uh, culture where uh, even though we have this philosophy, but we have uh, destroyed the environment. Partly because even if you are intellectually aware of uh, this, these kind of spiritual principles, but we have not internalized it. We have not imbibed it. We have not realized it. And there isn't that kind of a support structure around us that facilitates the growth of that spirit, that spiritual spirit and that culture. So I think spiritual education and restoration of spiritual culture is a must. And automatically in the environmental conservation and protection will happen. You know, I was hearing a lecture just this afternoon. It's a conversation rather. Srila Prabhupada was having with somebody in the Bhaktivedanta manner uh, in the 70s sometime. And um, he, was, he was telling the guest that, you know, love is the principle, he said. You can do something with love or you can do something without love. When you do something with love, then the person you're trying to please is very much pleased. And relating, and therefore, when you, um, because you love Krishna, when you see everything around you, it reminds you of Krishna. Mm. Therefore, because you love Krishna, everything connected to Krishna reminds you of him. And therefore, you can see Krishna everywhere in this sense. So he gave the example of uh, a parent seeing the toy or the slippers of the child. <laughs> and the parent loves the child. Upon seeing the paraphernalia or the belongings of the child, immediately thinks about that child with affection. So similarly, just as the parent loves the child and therefore will automatically uh, you know, see uh, the child in everything around, so to speak. So if we love Krishna, we will see the divinity in nature all around us. We will understand that this is Krishna's creation. Whose nature is it? It's Krishna's nature. And therefore we should protect it. We should conserve it. We should not destroy it. We should not harm it. And we should treat it with respect. And we will also develop the understanding that harming nature means disrespecting God. So for those of us who may be practicing devotees, but we may not have thought of it like that. You know, we may be chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and we may be doing so many worship, you know, acts of worship of the deities but then we may go and needlessly cut trees and we may do so many other things that are not necessary to do. Mm. Another thing that comes to mind is that <clears throat> one time when some devotee asked Srila Prabhupada about how he could see Krishna everywhere, he gave the example of his, of his own spectacles on the desk in front of him. And he asked the devotee, when you look at these spectacles, what do you see? What, what do you, whom do you remember? He said, we remember you, Srila Prabhupada. Why? Because these are your spectacles. So similarly, when you look at nature, you remember Krishna. That is how you learn to see Krishna everywhere. It's not necessarily that you see Krishna's form. <laughs> because the devotee was asking, is it that you see Krishna's form, so many Krishnas everywhere in every act of, is that how you see Krishna? He says, no. You see Krishna in the sense that you see the connection of everything with Krishna because this is all Krishna's property. So I'll extend that analogy a little more. Let's say that devotee, you know, brushed off the spectacles from the desk in a disrespectful manner. What would that mean? It would mean that he was disrespecting Srila Prabhupada. Correct? Because he was disrespecting or, uh, shall we say, not ill-treating something that was the property of Srila Prabhupada. So treating somebody's property badly means to treat that person disrespectfully. 
Mm-hmm. You know, let's say you go into somebody's house, you see his car parked there in the driveway, <laughs> and you go and kick the car, and you smash the car, and then you go to meet the person. But because you okay. and mistreated the car, you've already indicated that, you know, you have uh, treated the owner disrespectfully. Mm-hmm. See, if you did not know the connection, you did not know who owned the car, it was one thing. But all the more serious is the offense if you knew who owned the car and still you acted disrespectfully. So therefore, for devotees, it's all the more important that we treat, treat nature respectfully uh, in all her aspects. Nature, the water bodies, the forests, the trees, the plants, the animals, the birds, the insects, the hills, the rivers, you know, everything around us. Mm-hmm. Because we understand that treating nature disrespectfully means treating Krishna disrespectfully. And that is against the tenets of the bhakti cult. The love, the cult of devotion to the Lord. Therefore, the root is trying to love Krishna and understanding what it really means to love Krishna. Not just in terms of the physical acts of doing our sadhana, chanting our rounds and and going through the motions of doing activities in the day or worship and so on and so forth, but also to internalize it by understanding that there is a worldview that will come as a result of that love. Because if I love Krishna, as Prabhupada said, I will love everything connected to Krishna. And I will then see Krishna in everything. So when I see Krishna in the trees, why will I harm those trees? If I see Krishna in the rivers, why will I pollute the rivers? If I see Krishna in the air, understanding the air to be Krishna's energy, now why will I pollute the air? Hmm. So basically, that is how I see uh, bhakti ecology to be the real uh, alternative to the activist uh, environmentalism of today, which is left-oriented, as you rightly said. Mm. Uh, So we want to bring in, uh, we're not left or right or this or that, but we are God-centered. Bhakti centered. So we want to bring in a bhakti centered, ecologically driven um, environmental consciousness. Yes. You actually, see everything is holy, everything is divine. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. While you're speaking, I remembered a few things. How Shila Prabhupada, while the Juhu temple was being constructed, there are some trees in the perimeter of where the temple was to be yes. and the government authority said we will have to we will have to cut the trees yes and prabhupada said that's against our religion and prabhupada the devotees had to do various things but finally they insisted that the tree should be there so yes and prabhupada said specifically tell them it's against our religion to cut trees it's quite striking yeah mm. and uh, when you're talking about yeah. Krishna Bhagavan temple courtyard. Sorry? They all similarly with in the Krishna Balram uh, courtyard, yeah. Temple in the courtyard, yes. So I was thinking another thing is that we have Bhakti Thakur and Chaitanya Shikshamru talks about these four levels fear, desire, duty, and love. So if we apply these four even to nature, much of many environmental activists are trying to get people galvanized at the levels of fear and desire or maybe duty. It's a lot of fear. If you don't do this, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And they are dismayed. Why are you not recognizing that this is so dangerous? So on the other hand, if we talk about desire, you say that you you want to, you have lived in the environment, you have to take care of your uh, descendants, you know, instead of there's a common environmental saying that you know, we have we have not inherited the earth from our ancestors, we have borrowed it from our descendants. That means the way we have lived is that we have not left anything from our descendants. 
so in some way they try to create desire for concern for others or duty but in general just like when we talk about religion at these four levels fear desire and duty often fear desire and duty these levels are not very sustainable because if i feel that there is just because i'm doing something out of fear as soon as i feel that the danger is not there i'll stop doing it but when there is love then it will be much uh, then it is become sustainable so now so what you said is that if we develop love for krishna naturally we will develop love for nature uh, in one sense there there are two distinct applications of this those who are always already devoted to krishna we need to see that krishna is not just someone whom we worship through the chanting of our mantras but we serve krishna through the way we are environmentally conscious also so that's for those who are already bhaktas so that but for those who are not so is it easier to appreciate and love nature or is it is easier to appreciate uh, and love the source of nature love god or love krishna in one sense there are many people who who nowadays talk about the universe in a generic way and they say that uh, uh, i pray to the universe there is a whole category of prayers i saw in book uh, on amazon it's called prayers for atheists so <laughs> <laughs> so there is a british author who has said that the since frederick nietzsche in about 150 years ago sociologists have been predicting the death of god but it has not happened religion has had enormous staying power and he says that his theory is that this is because religion serves some human emotional and psychological needs so if we if we want atheism to spread then we have to find out how atheism can serve those needs and what they are saying is we instead of believing in some transcendental god for whose existence according to them there is no proof he says we can sanctify the universe so pray to the universe may the universe respond to your prayers and the universe is reciprocal the universe so in one way for some people they feel yes the universe is what it's real i see that nature is what i see so to develop concern for nature is it necessary to develop concern for god and uh, would it not be easier to develop concern for nature because it is visu- visu- visible and essential and uh, we can see that we need it but we don't see god we don't many people don't feel the need for god so do we need to go the in one sense i care for the environment i respect the environment do i need to bring in god to care for the environment it seems to be going like a long cut way yeah um our clear belief as devotees of krishna is yes it is necessary to believe in god to make our conservation of the environment sustainable and complete so i have given the theological background to it hmm the theology theological paradigm based on which we have such a a belief um before i come to that i'll just make a brief mention of these atheistic prayers that you mentioned humanity has been there before and done that worship of the universe or worship worship of the of nature even is not something new in fact in the bhagavad gita krishna speaks of five types of worshipers those who worship krishna <clears throat> you have the pure devotees the mahatmas you have those who are mixed devotees <clears throat> you have those who are worshipers of the demigods you have those who are impersonalists mm-hmm. who believe the absolute truth to be impersonal and finally you have those who are worshipers of the universal form 
Now, this fifth category is basically worshippers of nature, worshippers of the universe. Okay, yeah. it's a kind yeah. of a pantheism. Okay, pantheism is, is the belief in uh, the universe itself being God. So you don't need a personality behind it. You don't need a supreme intelligence behind it. There's no controller behind it. But nature itself is God. Is Ekatvena Prutatvena Bahuda Vishwatomukham that verse you're referring to? I think ninth. Okay, yeah. Vishwatomukham, the universe, yeah. The first to the universal form. So, So this is a kind of pantheism. So it's not a new viewpoint. It's been around for a long, long time. Okay. So that doesn't impress us very much because it doesn't have much substance. Uh, it lacks depth. It lacks any form of logical and, and certainly spiritual rigor. So to explain this point of why God, belief in God and faith and, and devotion in God is necessary to sustain our concern for the environment and its conservation and protection, I'll go back to the four points that you mentioned that Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur said. Hmm. That our motives for working, for performing any action are, you know, first there is fear, there is a sense of reward, and there is uh, uh, that, um, duty and then love. Yes? So, you know how I would see it? This is, by the way, a very beautiful analysis. This is an analysis, a, a categorization that I love to quote uh, on many occasions because it is so apt. Uh, I also see a correlation between this and the three modes of material nature and transcendence. Fear is a characteristic of the mode of ignorance. The reward and desire for material progress and accomplishments and, and enjoyment is a characteristic of the mode of passion. Hmm. Performing things out of a sense of duty is a characteristic of the mode of goodness. Hmm. Whereas love, if it is applied to the Supreme Lord, is a transcendental phenomenon hmm. that goes through modes of material nature. Here we are speaking of spiritual love, not ordinary mundane love. So, let's look at environmentalism or the approach to the environment from these four points of view. <clears throat> what is the uh, tamasic viewpoint or the uh, viewpoint for the mode of ignorance to um, the environment. That is essentially destructive. Right? Um, it's a demoniac kind of viewpoint. A satyam, a pratishtam, jagat ahur anishwaram. <laughs> As Krishna says in the 16th chapter, that they say that this universe is asatyam, it's false. It is apratishtam, it has no foundation. Mm. It doesn't have an Ishwara or a controller. It happened by itself. You know, so the views of the atheists today are not necessarily new. They have been around for a long time in different forms. So this is a kind of a, a demonic view that is... Uh, the cause of destruction in nature. Uh, if I remember right, in the very next verse in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, Etam drishti mavashtabdhya nashtatmanam pabuddhayaha parbhavat yugra karmanaha kshayayu jagato hitaha. Right? That's the next verse, am I right? Yes, 16.9. So, <clears throat> basically in this verse, Krishna will say, Etam drishti, by this viewpoint, this world view. What world view? That there is no creator, there is no God, you know, there is no foundation. Yes, to this whole world. You know, what comes? Uh, they are lost unto themselves. Nashta Atmanaha. Okay, so the people who hold such viewpoints are first of all lost unto themselves. And they are less intelligent, alpa buddhayaha, prabhavat yukra karmanaha, and they engage in uh, horrible acts, ugra, 
terrible acts, Ugra Karmana, Kshayayaha, which will lead to destruction, Jagato Ahita, to the, which are for the Jagat or for the world, Ahita, which is unbeneficial. Mm -hmm. So all the environmental destruction that we see is Ugra Karma. That Ugra Karma comes, it is propelled by principally the mode of ignorance. Now, the three modes of nature are not watertight compartments. They flow into each other. They merge and mix with each other. And as Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, that the three modes don't exist in isolation. They exist in combinations with each other. So then you have the mixture of the mode of passion that wants to, to um, enjoy the resources of material nature for a selfish purpose. Now, this Ukar Karmana could be caused by a combination of the mode of ignorance and passion. When the mode of ignorance drives environmental destruction, it is wanton, it is uh, irreparable, it is uh, just mindless completely. Mm. Just like simply just blowing up something, <laughs> simply just destroying something, you know, completely. The mode of ignorance, the passion, the rajaguna, the rajasic exploitation of the environment is a little better. Not much, but a little better. Because there is some semblance of, of sense there, because they know that if I do too much of this, then uh, I'll suffer the, mist the results of my own misdeeds. So they will still, they will still cut the trees, they will still pollute the atmosphere. Um, and in sattva, there is a kind of a sense of uh, duty. It is my duty to protect the environment. But we should also remember that sattva is not also truly selfless. Uh, in sattva also you have the um, desire to be free from misery. From the reactions of one's own karma. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, they perform religious activities to get rid of their, uh, you know, previous sinful activities or whatever. Now, for those people who may be atheistic, but adopt a kind of a sattvic approach to environment, it's a kind of a strange combination. So, on one hand, they, uh, they understand the need to maintain the harmony, etc., but they're not fully sattvic because they don't have that belief in God. You know, they don't have that sense of understanding the uh, relationship and the place of man in nature and man in nature and re relationship with God. They don't have that. So they're not fully sattvic. So the environmentalism of the activists could be a combination of so many things. And if they have political agendas and they have many other things, it, it further complicates matters. So therefore, these environmentalism that is prompted by the three modes of nature will never sustain, will be at worst completely self-destructive and at best short-lived. Because in this material world, as Krishna explains, no mode of nature lasts very long. The predominance of the modes is always rotating. Sometimes sattva predominates, sometimes rajas, sometimes tamas, and it goes up and down and up and down. Now, if sattva, which is the mode of sustenance, which is the mode of balancing, which is the mode of harmony, has to prevail with respect to the environment, if sattva has to become predominant, then we need the help of bhakti. Okay. Because sattva cannot, pre cannot prevail, sustain, unless there is strong bhakti. Because we see another mistake the environmentalists make is they see sustenance or sustainability only in the physical environment. They do not see sustainability in social terms of relationships. They do not see sustainability in, in other terms, cultural terms. So for them, and for environmentalists, 
the, it is only a question of the physical environment. Mm. But the devotees of the Lord, that the, tra the transcendental viewpoint sees it is a complete whole. And if your fundamental underpinning, your fundamental uh, paradigms and philosophical underpinnings are uh, rooted in uh, rajas and tamas and even ordinary sattva, it will not last. So therefore, even if theoretically, let us say, you bring about a state where you have environmental harmony, but you don't live a godly life, so you'll have social disharmony. You'll have dysfunctional relationships. You'll have cultural problems. So therefore, in order to uh, sustain environmentalism, it has not only to ensure that it broadens its scope to not just physical environment, but to uh, social, cultural, and other related areas. And it has to take shelter of a higher and a deeper uh, inclusive understanding of creation as a whole, which means to bring in Krishna or God into the picture. And I come back to the point I made right in the beginning and also last time, that your envi environmentalism will be incomplete unless you bring in Father God. Mm. And Krishna is actually the perfect environmentalist. The topmost environmentalist is, in, is Krishna. And you see that in his pastimes in Vrindavan. <clears throat> so as devotees of Krishna, you know, automatically, or if not automatically, at least by, by deliberate action and thought, we should try to follow in Krishna's footsteps and try to see how Krishna uh, acted with so much respect, so much love, you know, towards the entire environment of Raja, of Raja Bhumi, whether it was Govardhan Hill and according it the due respect and worship, whether it was uh, protecting the, um, the sweet waters of the Yamuna from the poison of Kaliya, protecting the other lakes, whether it was protecting all the various trees and branches by offering them worship. There are so many verses in the Bhagavatam where Krishna glorifies the trees of Vrindavan. Yeah. And speak of Krishna protecting and loving the cows, and not just the cows, but also the deer, the peacocks, and all the other life forms there. So in Krishna's pastimes, in Krishna's actions, in his thoughts, in his personality, as manifest in Vrindavan, we see the complete transcendental environmentalist. So therefore, we, we have to follow in Krishna's footsteps in order to achieve that kind of sublime environmental uh, scenario. Right? Beautiful. There's uh, one devotee who's written a paper on the same theme of Krishna as a um, Krishna as an environmental as the as a ideal deity for eco-friendly living, and yes. he's he takes some amount of metaphorical license. So he says that especially representative of Krishna's capacity to purge the environment of disruptive elements is uh, his Kaliya Leela. Yes. So Kaliya represents in some ways, we could say market capitalism or communism or materialism. And it was so toxic that even the birds flying above were being uh, killed by it. And then Krishna came and used his potency to subdue and then drive away Kaliya. And then Krishna re re restored the beauty and the harmony of the ecology of Vrindavan. So similarly, if Krishna comes and dances in our hearts, then the, the materialistic drives within us that make us do things that have toxic influences they can be driven away. And uh, 
So I was also thinking that when you said about sattva and beyond that to transcendence, one thing which uh, many environmentalists also are recognizing is that for people to actually give up consumerism, they need to find non-material enrichment. And if we don't bring in God, mere love of nature will not really give non-material enrichment because nature is also material. So one way we could say why merely loving nature is not enough is that as long as we are in material consciousness, we will want material pleasure. And the nature of material cravings are that they go stronger and stronger. And right now, if I am in Sattva Guna and I am reflective, I may say, okay, I live in harmony with the environment. But as Rajas and Tamas start increasing, then my desires will overpower my good intentions. So right. if one loves Krishna and has some, uh, has get some higher taste in the practice of Krishna Bhakti, then the craving that drives consumerism will subside. And that's yes. how also we could say that uh, just loving nature is not enough. Rather, when we love Krishna, then we will be able to act out our love for nature, act on our love for nature. Otherwise, we will not be able to sustain it. Your love for nature will become more meaningful, more concrete, more substantive, more happy when you love Krishna. Yeah, that's true. I read one more. He's a Bhakta scientist, Bhakta researcher. He, he contrasts, when I mentioned earlier that uh, India doesn't have much of a history of environmental protection or activism. So he, his, he has an interesting theory. He says that in India, there is the Bhakti worldview and there's the Advaitic, Advaitic worldview. And the Advaitic worldview in some ways holds that this world is an illusion. And the most important thing we need to do is to transcend this illusion. Whereas the Bhakti worldview holds that this world is also an arena for service. This world is also a manifestation of Krishna's energy. So, uh, so if environmental consciousness is to be fostered in India, maybe the Bhakti worldview would be more conducive for that than the Advaitic worldview. And if, uh, if now if you consider worldviews, uh, there is this world and there is the other world, there is the spiritual world. Now one of the defining differences between modern and pre-modern times is that in the pre-modern times, almost everyone in whichever part of the world they lived, they understood that there is some other world. And that is life's ultimate destination. Whether Christians had their heaven, Muslims had their Jannat, and Native Americans and Native Australians, they also had some understanding of another world. And this world is like a place of trial and travel. We have to live through it. So now the scientific revolution and the subsequent uh, evolution of human thought led to the rejection of the other world as a mythology. And then through technology, we got the hope or the dream that we could make this world into paradise itself. So we don't need any other world. We will just make this world into paradise. So, we could, so now in the attempt to make this world into a paradise, we have in some way started making it into hell because our efforts are backfiring. And uh, if we consider like a four quadrant diagram, you know, this we have this world, the importance of this world on the x-axis and the importance of the other world on the y-axis. So if somebody says neither this world matters nor the other world matters, then they are basically nihilistic. They can't do anything. Then we have the materialists and within that we have communists, capitalists, and to some extent we have even environmentalists. They say this world matters, but the other world doesn't matter. Or the other world doesn't exist, it doesn't matter, whatever. Then we have the, we have the Advaitins, 
that the other world matters, but this world doesn't matter. And then we have the bhaktas that this world matters and the other world matters also. So in some ways, those who say this world matters, but other world doesn't matter, their own desires eventually will not be, will not let them take care of the world, especially because now that we have the power to control the world, or at least we think that we have through technology. So to have power and then to not use power requires far go a greater self-control than to not have power at all. So when people throughout history had some level of materialism within them, but when there was no technology, we really felt that nature is much more powerful than us. We can't do much about it. Mm-hmm. Now through technology, when we think that, yeah, maybe we can subdue nature. So then to not do that without having any higher purpose is not going to be very easy. So in that sense, the bhakti worldview, which acknowledges the importance of this world, while also giving us giving due importance to the other world and giving us access to happiness streaming down from that level. That is the best way to actually sustainably take care of this world. Yeah. Actually, uh, as we discussed in the earlier part of our, of our chat, that till a few centuries ago, the culture of spiritual ecology was very much prevalent and pervasive even in Indian villages. So that culture was there, so there was no need for any kind of environmental activism because the environment was being automatically looked after. However, then there came a time when there was degradation happening. And for a while, you know, it, there may have been uh, intermittently here and there localized cases of activism we are not aware of. But in the last uh, century, in the last few decades, we've had several such uh, uh, people coming up. You mentioned one in the beginning, Chipko, the Chipko movement mm. of Sundarlal Bahuguna. And there have been several like that. There have been many, many instances of people now uh, really campaigning for maintaining the purity of the river Yamuna, or protest, some protesting against the destruction of the hills in Brajabhumi for mining and so on and so forth. So against for the cleaning of the river Ganga and you know, so there's a lot of activism going on. It could be more. It could be more definitely. We should have more. But as I said, unless there is a proper spiritual education, it's a humongous task. It's an uphill task. Because you've, you've taken away, you disempowered the villages and the common, common person. And you left him without the spiritual culture because of the materialistic and Western style of educational system that you introduced. You took away his spiritual culture, you took away his powers, and you centralized it. And now he has neither faith, nor any understanding of spiritual knowledge, nor is he doing his spiritual practices significantly. And even if he's religious, it's just a mechanical kind of a ritualistic type of a religion. And there are many people with some deep faith Certainly, but uh, <clears throat> in a large number of people, that substance is lacking. Their understanding of the spiritual ecology is lacking. And because now everything is becoming so materialistic and the government and the NGOs and so on, they try their best to rectify matters, but they're still going to release their sewage into the river. They're still going to throw an, you know, uh, rubbish somewhere else, you know. So this happens, you know, because of the lack of spiritual education. Mm-hmm. But coming to the issue of the other world and this world, yes, certainly um, the idea of the quadrant is an interesting way of putting it, of the four quadrants and the two axes. And bhakti is best placed because we are concerned about both worlds. Mm. 
Sometimes, however, we see that it is the devotees who are a little callous when it comes to environment. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and such things. And the Advaitins are more uh, sensitive and concerned, and they are the ones who are out in the forefront doing it. And we as devotees many times are shy of doing it, saying, you know, that's, uh, well, you just better chant, better sit and chant and, you know, do why, why get into all these other things. So curiously enough, we have a kind of an ironical situation or a paradoxical situation where those who give a lot of importance to the other world but not to this world seem to be doing more for this world in terms of the environment okay. than those who claim to give importance to both. So which means probably that it is time for us as devotees to also step up. You know, of course, a lot of devotees have done a lot. If you look at Govardhan Hill, you see there are uh, planted trees all around Govardhan Hill. You know, they've done a lot of work. So a lot of NGOs, a lot of faithful devotees, you know, from different uh, places and, you know, have done so much work. So we must appreciate that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think we need to make it more mainstream. This kind of an approach and this kind of a consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, let devotees also internalize this as something as critical to their spiritual life as, let's say, uh, you know, going for darshan of the deities or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think we must have this kind of a worldview that has to be encouraged. I think it's because the reason for devotees not having been so active in this is that perhaps they've not seen it like that. They have not been uh, accustomed to thinking like that. This kind of a worldview, a holistic kind of a worldview, you know, are probably a kind of a shall we say detachment, you know. Because I do remember when I was in Vrindavan and uh, there was a whole movement going on uh, to save the Yamuna. As you know, it's a great tragedy. Yeah. The Yamuna is diverted before she reaches Delhi and into the and diverted into agricultural fields for growing rice which is exported. It is diverted into industries in Delhi and surrounding places. And you don't have anything left of the Yamuna as she flows after Delhi, except the sewage and the industrial effluents that are then emptied out into the Yamuna. And what we get in Vrindavan is not real Yamuna water, except in the rainy season when the dams release some water. So that is a great tragedy, actually. So when many organizations were trying to get together to do something about this, you know, many of our devotees were reluctant, saying, you know, why should we get into all that? We have to chant our rounds, we have to, you see? So because devotees have not understood, uh, they have not internalized the larger uh, scope of Krishna consciousness. Today we are able to enjoy Vrindavan because somebody else did, did it for us. They built a temple for us. They preserved the holy dhams for us. You know? And, and as you rightly said, we borrowed it from our descendants. The environment is something we have borrowed from our descendants, not necessarily inherited from our ancestors. So, <clears throat> we have a responsibility. We have a sense of duty to seeing that the, the various uh, elements of the spiritual and devotional heritage that we have inherited are preserved and strengthened so that posterity can also avail of the benefits of, of, of these elements. Whether it's the Yamuna, it's the Ganga, it's the ghats of Vrindavan, the hills of Vrindavan, the pasturing lands of Vrindavan, or any other holy place or a, any other element of nature even. Yes, so that's what I think we need as devotees to expand the scope of our thinking and not just keep it narrowed down to just doing our rounds and just, and that's it. That, of course, is the foundation. That's the fountainhead of all our spiritual convictions and activities. 
if we don't chant our rounds, if we don't hear the Srimad Bhagavatam, if we don't uh, worship the deity with faith and love, then we will not have the right consciousness anyway. So then we will not be able to see the sublimity and the, the uh, divinity in nature all around us. So we have to have the, the overall conception, you know, that's true. Of transcendent ecology. Yeah, that's true. So, are there some things which you could uh, recommend what devotees could do? Because at one level, most of our movement is present in the cities. Yes. And uh, even at the time of Krishna, there was there were cities. Vindavan was a village. Mathura was a city. So, I don't think urbanization itself is the problem. Based on our last time's discussion, I was re-articulating it. Said that you know, meat eating may have been going on throughout human history, but with the industrialization of meat eating, of the meat meat um, meat manufacturing factory, we could say, you know, that the scale, three things: the scale, the cruelty, and the de- recklessness, the dangerousness. Like uh, that has been unprecedented. So maybe in some way, urbanization itself is not the problem, but maybe the the scale, the scale, the cruelty towards the nature and the recklessness or the dangerousness, that could be a problem. So what what could as a individual bhakti practitioner do to become more environmentally conscious? Mm-hmm. While it is true that urban settlements did exist in the Vedic times and earlier, we had Dwarka, we had Ayodhya, we had Hastinapur, yes, in the Prastha. Yeah. There. Uh, but those were eras when the opulences presented by nature were profuse. And these urban settlements were well spread out over large areas and probably didn't have the kind of congestion that we see today. And the people also didn't have the kind of consciousness that people of today have. So whilst I grant that urban areas have existed in the past, I would say that urbanization as it exists today has inherently some problem. That is the way I see it. Because it has become so infected, so to speak, with the modes of passion and ignorance that it is very hard for anyone living in the cities to cultivate the mode of goodness and to rise uh, to the spiritual platform and and grow on the path of bhakti or any uh, such spiritual activity. So to develop such a a pure consciousness or even an environmental consciousness in the kind of cities that we have is going to be very difficult. It is not easy. So organization at its core as let us say a strategy as a as a policy instrument has to be rethought today the predominant economic philosophy is that we must have more urbanization we must move the people from the village and from agriculture towards urban areas and this is a viewpoint that is articulated by mainstream economists uh, regularly everywhere So they basically want to intensify urbanization. So therefore, the urbanization as as it exists today, there is a problem here. It's a topic that will take a long time to discuss. Maybe we won't talk about it in detail now. So, but therefore, what I think we really need is to preserve also the rural areas properly 
and not to let the urbanization grow the way it is growing. And we see in the example of the current COVID-19 pandemic, now in India, just today or yesterday, I think they released a list of the hotspots. Okay, certain number of places which are hotspots where the lockdown has to continue. And there are certain areas which are green areas where they will probably relax the lockdown significantly. It's interesting that all the urban areas, the major metros are red zones. Why so? Because they are so congested. And even look at a place like New York. If you think that is, this is India, fine, but what about New York? What about London? What about so many other urban areas which are facing problems? So urbanization has problems. And that is well acknowledged. It's not, uh, it's something new. Uh, sociological problems, cultural problems, and, and a host of other types of problems. But still, economists and, and a variety of other thinkers today seem to believe that this is the way forward. So at least, first of all, uh, to answer your question, I would say we need to recognize the severe problems associated with rampant urbanization, mindless urbanization, uh, number one. Uh, number two, that also means that we must realize the importance of the villages, of the rural areas, and we must preserve them. At least intellectually and with our heart, we should be convinced of this. Without which, you know, it's going to be more difficult. It will be just a token environmentalism. Just growing a few plants in your home and flower pots on your terrace and just having a few vegetables that you grow there. And, okay, fine, very good. But it has to go deeper than that. Right? Then further, uh, what we should do is to uh, maybe follow those five guidelines that I mentioned last time those five criteria. You know, when we spoke of veganism, those five things that we spoke about yesterday, uh, the other time, other day, when we were discussing veganism, uh, they were essentially one, that what we utilize from nature, from the environment or from anywhere, has to be, I'll repeat that just to refresh uh, memory and for the benefit of those who maybe didn't attend, uh, see that discussion. Number one, that it must be scripturally recommended or at least permitted. At least not opposed. At least not prohibited. prohibited yeah. Okay. Second is that we must cause no harm yes. and not of disrespect. Yes, to anything and everyone, anything and everything that we use, cause no harm and offer no disrespect. So here I include, you know, human beings, I include uh, animals, plants, rivers, mountains, oceans, lakes, you know, everything, the air, okay? Third, utilize it in a mode of devotion to God. The process of obtaining it has to be done without causing harm respectfully and the utilization has to be done with devotion understanding that these are all gifts of nature understanding uh, to quote uh, one of the sentences of Prabhupada from his book was one of my favorite lines uh, that human prosperity flourishes by the gifts of nature and not by gigantic industrial enterprises right so recognizing that Actually, our happiness, our prosperity, our longevity, our success, you know, all depends on the gifts of nature. We must realize that we must use them not only without causing harm to them, but we must uh, love. It must be done with love. Uh, the cows must be milked with love. The crops must be sown and harvested and utilized with love. 
and ultimately they must be offered to Krishna with love. That was the fifth. Uh, and the fourth element was used in moderation. Whatever you use, uh, use it moderately. Um, don't over consume. So this moderation point is there to counter or to take care of this consumerist mentality. So, and the last one, offer to Krishna with love. So obviously you can't use anything which you can't offer to Krishna and which is not scripturally uh, authorized. So therefore, uh, in terms of what we can do and what we can't do, number one, let us avoid using anything that is not scripturally authorized. Therefore, that means give up alcohol, give up meat, give up gambling, give up illicit sexual activity, give up this, give up that, right? All of these things. Second of all, it also means that whenever we utilize everything, anything, be conscious now that you don't cause any cruelty to it. The other day I, I was just reading the news and there was some uh, article about some young man in India, one of the cities who was arrested or a group of young men because they whirled around a puppy and they smashed him to death, the puppy. And such cruelty coming up because they just, they just have no conception of any uh, you know, compassion or, you know, some refinement of the intellect that doesn't exist. So we must be very careful to not act in a cruel way towards animals, towards plants and trees and the air, towards the soil, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, even in our neighborhood here where I live, People were cutting down a tree and the, the branches also. And, and the reason for that is because the tree was shedding leaves and those leaves were falling into their building premises. And it was a big headache for them to clean those leaves every time. So just imagine, they were cutting trees and cutting off branches because um, they didn't want the leaves to fall in because they didn't want to do the... Uh, the, the task of cleaning up, you know. So we have to be very kind and we, are, we can't be disrespectful and can't offer cruelty to anything and anyone. So it's a question of cultivating this mindset wherever we are. And the item of moderation means that we should not come to the consumerist uh, propaganda. Today, uh, modern economics thinks that prosperity and success comes or is measured in terms of how much you consume and how much you own. Whereas this, the Vedic viewpoint is that prosperity and success and happiness is measured in terms of how little you own and how simply you live. So the modern urban lifestyle, the modern materialistic lifestyle is oriented towards flashy living, opulent living, overconsumption, Whereas the Vedic lifestyle is oriented towards simple living, consuming as little as possible, as much only as is required, not flaunting one's wealth. But if, and if excess wealth arrives by destiny or by the mercy of the Lord, we share it with others, use it in benevolent ways, especially in devotion to Lord Krishna. So therefore, in, in terms of consumption, we have to be very careful. We don't unnecessarily accumulate goods. The acquisitive spirit, the accumulative tendency has also to be reined in and has to be controlled. That's very important. We must not succumb to our desires to accumulate more and more goods when we go into the city marketplace, into the shopping centers. Yes, and this is again one of the problems of organization. They just simply uh, pour fuel into our dormant desires for acquiring more and more. So because these shopping malls and these roadside shops, the way they are decorated and 
the uh, goods are displayed in such a tantalizing manner and the way the advertising is done and the way the whole social kind of mindset is, the social fashions and what's cool to do and what is desirable. And so it just induces everybody to consume more and more and more. So there's no question of any environmental friendly living. If one uh, is uh, of this mentality. So one has to guard very much against this consumerist mentality. One has to try to believe in the principles of simple living and high thinking. Simple living refers to reducing your needs, your wants, there's a difference between wants and needs, living simply, minimize the number of clothes you need just as much as you really need, your paraphernalia at home, don't just accumulate more and more. There's this little uh, thing that I keep saying when people ask how much is enough, you know, <laughs> how much is enough to accumulate in terms of uh, goods that we have. And I don't know whether I mentioned it in the discussion last time, but anyway, because it's relevant to the question you ask, I'll just say it again, and it's practical. That if the desire arises in our mind to acquire a certain good, a certain item, we should ask ourselves the question, is it necessary? Is it required? If the answer is no, that ends the matter. If the answer is yes, ask yourself a second question. Do I really need this item? If the answer is no, fine, matter ends there. If it's yes, ask yourself a third question. Do I really, really need this item? If the answer is still a yes, then okay, go ahead and buy it. Provided you also fulfill the other four criteria. That the item that you desire to obtain is, is not something that is prohibited by the scriptures, that it is that you've not obtained it by any violence or cruelty or disrespect. Yes. And also that you utilize that item lovingly when you obtain it. And before you use it, that you offer it to the Supreme Lord. So that's another tip that we have to reduce the uh, consumption patterns that we have and reduce the wastage. Vedic culture essentially was one where there was no waste. Today, our consumption patterns are of such a nature that high consumption means high wastage. Yeah. Therefore, one of the means of judging economic advancement and prosperity in economics is the garbage disposal index. The more the garbage that you've disposed, the more prosperous you are as a society. Oh, okay. Whereas That's the way quite a Thomasic way of looking at it. Yes. The Vedic culture was that the Vedic culture was, you know, first of all, there's nothing called waste. It's all something that is uh, a part of a recycling process. So whether it's paper, <coughs> paper or cloth or wood or utensils and metals and so on, you know, it could be recycled, it could be reused. Right. And then the other things like, all right, yes, try to use uh, items that are organic, try to have your little rooftop uh, or your veranda, a little garden and so on and so forth. Support uh, uh, activities and ventures that are of this sort, especially, you know, those types of communities and projects that uh, try to establish self-sufficiency. Hmm. So these are some of the tips that I would say. It's a combination of mindset plus practical actions to do. There are many more, but I'm just giving some of them right now. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, I think within, within urbanization also, we all can make it less toxic by yeah. adopting various 
practical measures and yes maybe maybe you can conclude by speaking a little bit about you mentioned about projects for eco friendly living and you have been you have been, you have pioneered a project gokul dham near belga would you like to speak a little bit about that project and your vision okay. how it is coming up right gokul dham is a is envisioned as a self sufficient uh, vedic eco village project a self sufficiency farm project uh, being inspired by the teachings of shri prabhupada and the idea is to have a community of devotees that lives there following the principles of uh, simple living and i think so it's work in progress we have a long way to go before we can attain the target of self sufficiency in all respects or at least in most respects so our devotees are living a very simple life there it's about 40 kilometers from the place where i stay the city where i stay the town belgaum in the state of karnataka in india and um the devotees there don't use electricity i think that is among all the projects in our movement this is among the few if not the only one where we are avoiding electricity isn't it yes maybe not the only one there are i'm sure a couple that also don't use electricity but that's rare it's rare yes uh, but we are a little we are we are a little more rigid when it comes to uh, trying to live simply so we try to not use uh plastic although to some degree some sometimes it's unavoidable but our attempt is to find substitutes in course of time so eliminate all the products of the modern industrial civilization you know so industrial we, we try our best to avoid using industrial materials uh industrial products and so on no chemicals certainly no chemical fertilizers and pesticides and so on uh we also don't use naturally no petrol and diesel uh mm. although we do travel to the project in vehicles that are that use petrol and diesel uh but within the project we don't use that we use natural sources of energy uh including for cooking for water lifting and water transportation and such like for lighting also um we try to grow our own food uh we haven't attained full success yet vegetables we're almost quite there uh but grains it will take a while we are struggling with water self sufficiency self sufficiency so once we have that then we will go on to this uh so that's the kind of life very simple life very rustic with how even the housing materials are basically non chemical non industrial no cement steel plastic used in the construction of the housing and shelters we have a small little temple there which is within the ashram altar is also made of stone and mud and limestone and so on so we have cow and they graze so that's a little description of this gokul dam project i have been there and uh, i could see the devotees there are very inspired many of them are uh, using their their engineers by background they using the engineering to come up creative solutions for local generation or local production of things and uh, it seems that it has created a significant awareness at least in the nearby areas of maharashtra and karnataka where people come to visit and see that whether such a project is actually possible it's they are quite uh, quite amazed to see uh, people choosing to live like this voluntarily because most people as the trend is want to live the leave the as i consider primitive villages and go to cities 
but to see young educated intelligent people voluntarily choosing to live lives of simplicity and spirituality it uh, speaks volumes for many people and makes them rethink their priorities in life so apart from specifically what is achieved over there is having a model of like that has ripple effects in society also yes you know we don't expect that everybody will live like the way the devotees live there we know there's not a practical or a realistic ex ex uh, expectation but what we want to do is to be like a beacon light for the world to send out a message to the world that you don't really need all the things you think you need to be happy in your life and to be prosperous we want to get people to think about what real happiness is and what are the sources of happiness we want to redefine prosperity and success and we also want to make people experience uh, a little bit of that joy that comes in living in such a sattvic atmosphere where there is which is based on devotion to krishna and uh, simple living long way to go but nevertheless it's the beginning it has come a long way also it's a long way to go it has come a long way since started yes. and and i hope that they can more and more devotees and others also feel inspired to establish such projects and work seriously on that but it needs a lot of commitment yeah and it is also a very clear vision about what needs to be done this mm -hmm. morning so environmentalism is happening naturally there because we're learning more and more about how the ecological balances happen you know living on the land is itself a massive learning experience one understands how that local ecosystem functions and then one has to blend into that rather than uh, superimposing our conceptions there which to some degree is happening even in our case because here we have sort of intruded into nature into spaces that were probably earlier being taken up by animals and so on so to some degree we are also guilty of that intrusion but we hope it is not to a very significant degree and we hope that by this we can um, create a prototype or a kind of an example that will be inspiring to the world yes manaj we are walking your talk in this specific sense by pioneering a project and um, so if devotees want to know more about the gokul dham project is there a website where they can visit or is it on the iskon belga website or well uh, a little bit but i have consciously not promoted it in a big okay. way okay uh, for the simple reason that you know we have a few devotees there a small team and there is a lot of work to be done there okay um, so we want to have a, a at least develop the basic infrastructure like water and a few things like that and food and make arrangements by the time we are ready to receive more and more guests we already have many guests coming in mm. professors bring their students environmentalists come in groups and you know school children come in with their teachers and general uh, people who are curious to know what we are doing they come in our devotees from belgaum and from other cities they come to see so we do have a lot of guests anyway uh, but i think we'll wait uh till we have set up our infrastructural okay. situation there in a better way at least water especially okay water and food and, and some further living facilities yes that is true yes maj think prabhupada yeah. when you are establishing mayapur also find they should not expect to find very wonderful uh you know cottages and and things like that it's it's very simple it's beautiful 
but it's also very, very simple. Yes, Mahaji. We've covered a lot of territory, but I'll just briefly try to summarize. So we started about started with the origin of environmentalism that all, in some ways it is because of anthropocentrism coming from Christianity. In many ways, it is also materialism coming from uh, rejection of God and uh, belief that technology gives us the power to do whatever we want with nature. Yes. And through industrialization, that became very strong. And we differentiate between environmentalism, which is a leftist political activist movement with genuine concerns, but also embroiled with politics. Whereas ecology or eco, eco, ecological concern or ecosystem, that will be much more localized. And it can organically... Can I interrupt for one moment? Yeah. No, I, would, I wouldn't say that all forms of environmentalism or environmental activism are uh, leftist in nature. Some of them certainly are. Okay. But if you look at the example of Sundarlal Bahuguna and the Chipko movement, yeah. his environmental activism was based on his spiritual beliefs. Yes, of course, yeah. Mr. Agarwal, who was campaigning for Mother Ganga, so his activism was also based on spiritual beliefs. Yes, that's true. The Western models of environmentalism are based on the left, left-wing kind of approach. Yeah. Okay. Indian activists, the homegrown Indian activists, I'm not speaking about those Indian activists who are influenced by the Western approaches. Mm. Homegrown, uh, you know, uh, environmental activists here of the kind I've mentioned, they are not left of center. Mm, yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Then he discussed about, so, you know, what the problem is more or less well known. The ideological cause of the problem and the practical solution, what could be done. So in that, he discussed that uh, when we, we may want to l take care of nature, but just the attempt to do that is not likely to work because the exploitative mentality will come in. We talk about fear, desire, duty, love. And then you mentioned that when we bring God, then the environmental activism becomes sustainable. So these are associated with three modes. And uh, we get non-material enrichment through the practice of uh, bhakti, which can free us from the consumerist mentality, which is the cause of environmental problems. And then in, in, in philosophically speaking, bhaktas care for both this world and the other world. But practically, we might have a more insular attitude where we don't really, we're not so socially engaged. And other Advaitans who don't care, who consider the world to be illusion, actually may care for it more. So we need to become more become more aware of what bhakti means. And when we care for Krishna, it's like if we, the special Prabhupada, we respect his spectacles, his glasses. So similarly, we care for Krishna, we need to care for his nature also. And then as far as what could be done at an individual uh, by devotees, we talk about those principles, you know, what do what is, even if we are living in an urbanized setting, we, we recognize the importance of villages, and try to preserve it as much as possible. And by living in the urbanized settings, we make it as less toxic as possible by doing what is, I try to create a rhyme or a san sanction, then uh, sanction, compassion, moderation, devotion. There's one more you mentioned, uh, yeah. five factors. Love. Okay. Devotion, that is offering with devotion, but when you try to- Okay, love, I'm working with love. No, yes. No cruelty. No cruelty. Uh, that was compassion. And then use with you. I mean, with love and devotion. Okay. So use with love and devotion. Offer in devotion. Yes. The two different things. Right. Okay. So that way we could within our particular places we can make some become more environmentally conscious. And of course, there are devotees who are trying to do this, and they can be supported in whatever way is possible. So we as actually 
bhakti theology has a way to can integ can be provide philosophical foundation for grounding environmental concerns in a holistic world view and if that opportunity is tapped then bhakti can actually do a lot of good not just for the environment but for reawakening spiritual consciousness in the world through environmental consciousness yes very nice i think we could summarize it in in two words bhakti ecology bhakti ecology yes maharaj because ecology deals with the relationships of living entities uh, amongst themselves and with the with the uh, other the, the inanimate world and bhakti understands the conception of the relationship with god <clears throat> and sees the creation with respect to god and mm. with each other so that gives a more a deeper perspective so we we just don't want to be environmentalists we just don't want to be only plain ecologists but our approach is a bhakti ecology yes uh, you know something like that so i guess that will be something very wholesome very holistic thank you very much for your time and for joining this is always a uh, illuminating to have your association yeah so thank you very much and i hope we'll meet again soon yes i look forward to that we'll all look forward to that we and our viewers <laughs>